All right, we're going to continue with the inclined plane, the static friction, and we're going to look at the idea of a static friction. If we had a block, if we had a block sitting on an inclined plane, and we want to break the static friction going downwards, and the object then would be moving at a constant acceleration going downwards. We want to take a look at the forces and the relationship that we have in regards to the plane. So we have this block, and we're going to give it a little tap on the side here just to break the static friction. Okay, we're just trying to break a static friction here. Well, if we take a look at the forces here, okay, and this object will then start moving at a constant acceleration or constant velocity going downward. So we're going to give it a tap. We're going to give it a tap, and we're going to move it at a constant velocity. Well, let's take a look at our forces that we're dealing with here. We have our force of gravity. We have our force normal, and we have our force of parallel. So we have our force of gravity, our force normal, and our force parallel. What we are looking at here is if we have the incline plane, we have the incline plane that we've been working with, and the object is motionless because of static friction. And I give it a little tap, and it starts to slide down the inclined plane. Give it a little tap, and we start getting a slide going down the inclined plane. That's what we're looking at in this situation. So if we take a look, we're breaking the static friction. We have the force of friction that's pushing upwards on this. It's a static force of friction because it's holding it motionless at that point. If we look at this force of friction, this force of friction is equal to mu times our force normal. This is equal to mu times our force normal. Well, we take a look here. We have this force of friction, and we have this force parallel that's pushing it down the plane. And if we move at a constant velocity, this means my acceleration is going to equal zero, which is going to imply then that our force net is equal to zero because our force net is mass times acceleration. We are moving this at a constant velocity going downwards. <coughs> if we take a look at this force parallel and the force of friction, If we have a net force of zero and acceleration of zero, what has to be true about this force of friction and the force parallel? Dylan, what would have to be true about this force parallel and this force of friction? If we are moving at a constant velocity, acceleration equals zero, and our force net is equal to zero then, what would have to be true? They're balanced forces. They're balanced forces, so they have to be equal, but opposite. Okay, so this force parallel has to be equal but opposite to the force of friction. Or if I would take the sum of my forces, they would be add up to equal zero. 
So they have to be equal but in an opposite direction. While taking a look at our force of friction is equal to mu times our force normal, This force of friction is going to be equal to opposite to the force parallel. So force parallel will equal mu times our force normal. So when we're talking about a static friction, or a coefficient of friction, if we are moving at a constant velocity, once again, that's if we are moving at a constant velocity. If we're not moving at a constant velocity, this is not going to be true. But if we are moving at a constant velocity, our coefficient of friction is going to equal our parallel force divided by our normal force. Now, once again, this is guaranteeing that we are moving at a constant velocity. Well, if we take a look at this ratio here, force parallel over force normal, this value of theta, once again, goes up to here. This theta that we have is this theta here. Using our good old buddy Pythagoras. Oh, where are you? Using our good old buddy Pythagoras. He just never goes away. And knowing that this is a right triangle. What is the relationship between theta, our force parallel, and our force normal? What is our trig ratio relates those two together? Ozzy? What relates this angle theta Tangent. to this side and this side? That is correct. So this is equal to the tangent of theta. So if we're moving at a constant velocity, this mu is going to equal to the be equal to the tangent of this angle theta. Once again, we have, we can't have any force applied to this. If we're moving at constant velocity, we can we can get a value of theta or mu there. Let's take a look at a problem. We'll go through two different problems here. Once again, we we it doesn't hurt to continue to go over these ideas. We have an inclined plane. We have a 5 kilogram mass. We have a 10 kilogram mass hanging downwards. We have mu is equal to 0.1. We need to decide which direction is our mass is moving. Can we calculate? your force of gravity, your force parallel, your force perpendicular, and this force that's being applied. Go ahead and calculate them. Oh, I think I need a value of theta there, don't I? Oh, let's go 20 degrees. That would probably help out.
Okay, Jordan, do you have your, your forces here? Yeah. Okay, what's your force parallel? Um, force parallel is 16.8 newtons. Force perpendicular? 46.1. And then your force applied over here? We have 10 kilograms pulling downwards. 98.1. Okay, so those are forces there. Okay, the other thing that we could probably calculate is our force of friction, which is mu times our force normal. Riley, what do Riley, you get for the force of friction? Four point six nine. Four point six nine. Uh, it's four, four point six zero nine or four point one. Let's go point one here. Okay, so we have a force of friction. We don't know which direction that force of friction is going yet. But if we take a look, we have ninety eight point one newtons that's pulling downwards which is being pulled up through the rope in the pulley system here. We have force parallel, which is 16.9 newtons going downwards. So okay, make the decision which directions are the mass is moving. Once you make that decision which ways the masses are moving, then you can determine which way the friction is going. Is it going down the plane or is it going up the plane? Because friction, once again, is the resistance to movement. Find your force net, which is the sum of our forces. And then determine what the acceleration is of the system. Anna what, Anna, what do you get for your net force? I got negative 85.91. How did you come up with that? I use the the force parallel minus the force of friction minus the force acceleration. Are uh, the applied force? So we have the applied. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's take a look. What's happening? Are we moving up or down the plane, Anna? Are are we moving? Is the object moving up the plane or is it moving down the plane? Up the plane? Up the plane. It's going up the plane because we have 98.1 newtons here that's pulling it upwards. Okay, we have a force parallel that's moving it downwards at 16.8 newtons here. Now the force of friction, which direction is the force of friction going to go? Is it going to go down the plane or is it moving up the plane? Down the plane. Down the plane because we have to resist 
We have to resist the motion. The motion is going up the plane, you said. So we are resisting that. So we have 98.1 newtons going upwards, but then we have 16.8 newtons going downwards, which is in the opposite direction. Now, once again, what I suggest you do is whatever your motion is, make that your positive direction. It'll make it easier if you just always make that the positive direction. So we have a negative 4.61 newtons going downwards and a negative 16.8 newtons also going downwards. So what would be our net force then? 76.69. 76. 0.69 newtons. That is correct. So that is our net force. So we want to find our acceleration of the system, but what mass do we divide by here? What is our mass that we divide by, Tess? I'm sorry, what? 15, because we have to deal with the entire. We have to go to the 10 plus the 5 to give us the 15. So we can divide by 15 by 15. So test, what is our acceleration? 5.11 meters per second squared. That is correct. That is correct. Okay, once again, just going back over the ideas that we talked about last week, just reviewing some of these ideas. Okay, it takes 420 grams to move the block up the plane at a constant velocity when tapped from behind. So we are tapping this from behind. We're giving it a little tap here to break the static friction. And then it will move at a constant velocity from behind. We want to calculate the coefficient of friction. Some key ideas here is that we are moving at a constant velocity going up the plane once we tap it from behind. Okay, we tap it from behind. We have a 220 gram mass here. We have 420 grams here. We tap it from behind and then we'll start to slide up the plane. And we want to calculate the coefficient of friction. We have 10 centimeters here. We have one meter here. What we do not have is we don't have an angle. What does this angle theta have to equal here? How can we calculate this value for this angle theta? Well, we have a right triangle here. We know this is one meter. We know this is 10 centimeters. Which trig ratio relates these two sides of our triangle? together. Which trig ratio would relate 
the 10 centimeters and the one meter to the value of theta. Liam? Sign. The sine. The sine of theta is equal to, well, we have 10 centimeters over one meter. But we have a problem with that because we have different units. So we can take a look at one meter is equal to hopefully 100 centimeters. We can take the inverse sine of 10 divided by 100. and calculate this angle. Lucas, what does this angle come down to? Ah, uh, you're not intrigued yet. Uh, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, let's see. Andrew Hess. We have sine of theta is equal to 10 over 100. What can we do to solve for theta here? Andrew. We have the sine of theta is equal to 10 over 100. I want to solve for theta. How can we solve for theta? Hmm. Nathan, what can we do to solve for theta? Take the inverse sine. Inverse sine. We have the inverse sine of 10 divided by 100. What's our value for theta? 5.74. 5.74 degrees. Now, when we when we say we have a constant velocity, we're going to look at this a different way now rather than just on the front side here. When we have a constant velocity, when we state that we have that, this means Our acceleration is equal to zero, which implies force net is equal to zero. Once again, those three things are connected together. If you say one of those, the other two will be implied. If I say it's being moved up at an acceleration is equal to zero, that means my velocity is a constant and I have my force net is equal to zero. If I say my net force on the object is equal to zero, that means I have acceleration is equal to zero and my velocity is a constant. So all those things are implied in regards to when one thing is said, the other will be true. Well, let's take a look now. We have two hundred twenty grams we have two hundred and twenty grams, which we can write hopefully as point two two kilograms, moving three decimal places. We have 420 grams, which is 0.42 kilograms. This is our force that's being applied. Go ahead and calculate your Force applied, 
your force parallel and your force perpendicular. Bennett, what do you have for your force applied, force parallel, force perpendicular? I'm um, still trying to get it right now. Hold on. Um, I almost have it. For sure. I'm not sure if this is right. Do you just you just add up the grams and then do the sine of 5.84? Oh, whoops, I did it wrong. Never mind. We have to convert it to kilograms. Okay, yeah, I forgot to do that. So we have 0.22 and 0.42 and 0.22 times our 9.81 because this would be 0.22 times 9.81. Force parallel will be sine of our degrees angle that we calculated, 5.74. Got 4.12 for the force applied. 4.12 newtons. And then I got 0.1 for force parallel. And then, and then 0.99 for force perpendicular. Yeah. Yes, no, maybe so. What do you think, everybody? Is those, those good? Same force applied to the other two that I got different things. Uh, what do you get for the other two? For the parallel, I got 0.22, and for the perpendicular, I got 2.15. 2.15 newtons here, and what's the other one? 0 0.02? 0 0.22. 0 0.22. Yeah, separated on accident, it's my fault. So you get this to be 0 0.22? Yes. Point. All right. So what we have here is we have our force applied, our force parallel, and our force perpendicular. Now how we normally calculate this force of friction is mu times the force normal or force perpendicular. But the problem is we don't have the value of mu. But what we do have is we have that we'll be traveling at a constant velocity when moving up the plane. Okay, we will have a constant velocity as we tap. So that means the sum of our forces must equal to zero. 
and that's moving up the plane. Moving up the plane, the sum of our forces must equal zero. Well, I have my force applied, which gives me 4.12 newtons. That's moving it up the plane. We have our force parallel, which wants to move it down the plane, which is a negative 0.22 newtons, because that's going to want to move it down the plane. These are equal but opposite, or not equal but opposite, but in opposite directions. One's moving it up the plane, the other's moving it down the plane. But when I add these up, I have to add up the value of zero. So what we have to be able to add into that is our force of friction. And they must add up to equal value zero. Now this force of friction may be a negative force. That's fine, but I'm not going to put the negative there yet. I'm not going to subtract off the force of friction. I'm just going to put it as a plus, and if my solution comes down to a negative, it comes down to a negative, which it should do. So I could add my 4.12 and negative 0.22, take it to the other side. Lucas, what do you get your force of friction to equal? 3.9 newtons. 3 .9 newtons. And this should be a negative, but all that means is it's going to be sliding it down the plane. It's going to resist the motion going upwards. Okay, so that 3.9 newton just means, the negative just means it's going in the opposite direction. So our force of friction is equal to mu times our force normal once again. Our force normal is our force perpendicular, 2.15. So we can divide and we can divide. by this And we get a value of 1.8, which is not really a realistic coefficient of friction, but yeah, that's what I get for not checking any numbers as I go through this. But what we're able to do is sort of work problems backwards. Now I know when we talked on the front about the tangent, taking the tangent of taking the inverse tangent of theta or taking the tangent of theta and getting the coefficient of friction, which is fine, but that's only when you, you're trying to break a static friction and you have no force applied. If you're just a block on a sliding plane, okay? So you can calculate this coefficient of static friction when you don't have any forces applied. But when you have forces that are being applied to this, okay, that's, that's going to change the dynamic of what you're dealing with here. Because when looking at the front, all we're looking with, looking at this here, 
is we're just looking at a block that's sliding down the plane, breaking the coefficient of friction. We have no other forces that are being applied to that. When you have the forces that are being applied, then you start running into some issues then. But when there's no force applied and you're looking at breaking the static friction, you can take the tangent of theta and get a coefficient of friction. Okay, we will have a quiz on Wednesday on friction forces. Okay, in your packet, you should have a review sheet that says uh, review, quiz, physics, review, quiz, friction forces. Um, we will have a quiz on Wednesday over the idea of friction forces. If we take a look at the review sheet, if you look at problem, uh, take a look at problem three. A block of wood is pushed horizontally at a constant velocity uh, by a 20 newton force. Calculate the coefficient of sliding friction. So we have a block that's being pushed horizontally by some force applied. This block is 10 kilograms. And we have a 20 Newton force that's applying this force to it. We want to calculate the coefficient of sliding friction. Well, once again, our velocity here is going to be a constant. Once again, we then have acceleration is equal to zero. And we have our force net is equal to zero, which is the sum of our forces. Well, if we take a look, we only have a force that's being applied to this. We are sliding this horizontally. We have a friction that's going to resist this motion, which is equal to mu times our force normal. Go ahead and calculate your normal force. which in this case is going to be equal to opposite the force of gravity. Our sum of our forces must add up to equal zero since we have a constant velocity. We have a force applied, which is 20 newtons. Pushing it this way. We have plus our force of friction, which we're going to take it this way, which is going to give us a negative quantity. Our force of friction is mu times force normal.
So we have 0 is equal to 20 plus a negative mu times our force normal, which is 98.1 newtons. Katie, what do you get for your value of mu? I'm still working on it. All right, that's fine. I got point two. Point two? Taking your 20 and divided by 98.1. Take a look at problem number four on the back. A bag of leaves with a mass of 75, 78 kilograms is pulled at an angle of 20 degrees to the ground at a constant velocity. Coefficient of sliding friction is 0.21. Calculate the force required to pull at that constant velocity. Once again, most of the time when you're dragging those bags of leaves, um, you maintain a pretty good constant velocity. You break your static friction. Um, you don't usually accelerate as you're pulling those bags of leaves. If anything, you... Uh, you accelerate in a negative direction. So you have a negative, you start slowing down a little bit. So we are pulling this bag of leaves at an angle of 20 degrees. We have 78 kilograms. We have an angle of 20 degrees. So here's our force applied. We have mu is equal to 0.21. We have, once again, velocity is equal to a constant, which will then imply that the force net is equal to zero. So the sum of our forces must equal zero. And we need to calculate this force being applied. Go ahead and calculate your normal force. We have our force of gravity, which is going to equal our force normal since we are on a horizontal plane. We are given the coefficient of friction, so we can find our force of friction then, which is mu times force normal. So go ahead and find your force of friction. But we have a problem here, don't we? Is our force normal equal to our force of gravity?
this is going to be an issue because our force of gravity is not going to be equal to our force normal. You remember back to when we're pulling at an angle upwards? Our force normal was equal to the force of gravity minus this force applied going vertically. which is Fa sine of 20, and this would be Fa cosine of 20. So we have a problem there. Our force gravity is not equal to our force normal. It's going to make us work a little bit more, but it's okay. So our force of gravity is the 78.78 times 9.81. So we have 765.2. Newton's minus this. I'm just going to go F. Sine of 20 degrees. So our force of friction then is this 0.21 times 765.2. minus this F sine of 20 degrees. Our force that's making it slide sideways, which is parallel to our surface, is F times the cosine of 20 degrees. So when I add these forces up, they must add up to equal zero. I'm just pausing to let everybody catch up here.
So if we sum all these forces in the horizontal plane, okay, we have a force that's pushing it sideways. This has to equal zero because we have a constant acceleration. So we have F cosine of 20 and then we have our force of friction which is plus a negative 0.21765.2 minus F sine of 20. I'm trying to debate, and we'll see how this turns out. I think it'd just be an opposite sign. Whether if I throw this negative in here or not, we'll look, let's see what happens. It's just going to give us an opposite sign. So we have F cosine of 20 plus a negative 0.21765.2. Plus a 0.21 F sine of 20 degrees. And this is equal to a value of zero. Adding the 0.21 times 765.2 to both sides. That comes down to 160.7. And on the right hand side, we have F cosine of 20 plus 0.21 F sine of 20. Now, to solve for F, we can take and we can factor out an F, use some of our algebraic skills. And then divide both sides by this quantity. So we have one sixty point seven divided by quantity cosine 20 plus 0.21 sine 20. Hundred and fifty eight point
once again, you, your keys to these problems is to be able to note what occurs within the problem. The key idea when dealing with these problems, when your velocity is equal to a constant, that gives you your acceleration is equal to zero and your force net is equal to zero, which means if I add up all my forces, they have to add up to zero. So those are key things to remember as you go through the problems and whether it's the homework problems or the problems we've had here. Um, just remember as you go through them, you have to deal with you know, working through the sum of the forces in a direction, whatever the motion of the, or whatever the direction of the motion is. I got a question. Sure. I keep getting 171.1. 171.1? Yeah. I plugged in like four times. I don't know if I'm wrong or not. What did everybody else get? I could have botched up my calculations too. I got 159.07. 159. You have to watch when you're when you're putting in when you're putting it in because your 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 calculator may throw parentheses in there. You need to make sure that you close out the parentheses with the trig function. So when you're dividing, you have the cosine parenthesis cosine of 20. Make sure you close them out. Minus 0.21 times the sign of 20. You need to close oh, both of those out I, also. Because that's if you don't if you don't close those parentheses out and quantify that you'll run into problems. So you have 160.7 divided by parenthesis cosine of 20. You have to close that out. Minus 0.21 times the sine of 20. You have to close it out, but then you have to close out the initial parenthesis here. You have two parentheses. You have a parenthesis, the initial parenthesis that goes with this. And then you have two parentheses that are here that you had to worry about. Uh, I'm sorry, I put a minus in there. It should be a plus. So you have to just watch your, your calculator and your what you're dealing with your calculator. Okay, once again, um, the homework. You have homework that is sitting there now. Um, you have a review for the quiz, um, which will be on Wednesday, sitting there now. I'll put uh, solutions are also there uh, for you for the, the review sheet. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Any of the questions that you might have. Any other questions that, as we go through this, as we went through this, any other questions that you come up with? There'll be some fill in the blanks. The, vo the vocabulary at the beginning will be some just fill in the blanks or fill in the blanks. All righty, I've used my allotted time. Um, once again, if you have any questions on any of the problems, feel free to email me. I'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. Uh, but one day we'll have a quiz. I might open it up initially with any type of questions that you may have uh, and then allow you to get the quiz at that point, um, if that will help out at all. All right, 
And I have nothing else for you today. Take care of yourself. Right, get some work done. Adios. We'll see you tomorrow or see you Wednesday. Thanks.